I once heard a great definition of stories. Someone once said, stories are data with soul. Isn't that a great definition of stories? Data with soul. But you know, at some point, you've got to break the soul down into pure data. Uh, And the next speaker coming up is an expert on data. Not only is he an expert on data, but he's an expert presenter of data. And if you go to one of his TED Talks about how beautiful data is, you'll notice that he's almost had 10 million hits for one talk on data. And he's Swedish. (laughs) So he must obviously be presenting his data with a considerable amount of soul. And to do that right now with us today, we're very happy to welcome on stage a great round of applause, Mr. Hans Rusli. Thank you very much. We often discuss the world in terms of if we are optimistic or pessimistic. I'll turn that around whether we are knowledgeable or ignorant. Let me start here exemplifying some questions. Some of you may have come around them. I used to ask this. Why do I ask about measles vaccine? Because people around the world need some basic services. School, health service, infrastructure like roads. And if I would pick one thing in health service, is that we want all young kids to be vaccinated against the most nasty diseases. And the best established vaccine that can save most kids is measles vaccine, messling in Swedish. And, and, and the question is, how many of the children who are born in the world now get this vaccine, which is produced in advanced factories far away from where the children should be vaccinated? How many of them do get it? Is it 20%, is it 50%, or is it 80%? Can I have a guess by hand here? How many think that it's 20% of the children? How many think that it's 50% of the children? How many think that it's 80% of the children? It was good you invited me. (laughs) It's 80%. 83% of the children in the world get this advanced medical product in high quality, being kept cool by the district nurse all the way until they get a safe injection in their arm. 17% don't get it. That means out of five children in the world, four get it. We have one to go. This makes a big difference. Your answer corresponds more or less to what it was 30 years ago. And when we ask the Swedes, they answer like this, and the Norwegians answer like this, congratulations, uh, (laughs) and the Americans like this. The problem is that when I go to the zoo and ask the shimps, 33% get it right. (laughs) It's funny, isn't it? But what does it mean? It means that this is not ignorance. It's a huge preconceived idea that makes the people in our country to answer worse than random. They would have answered better had they not seen the question. (laughs) Because then they would have guessed, like the shimps. The shimps don't understand the question. I take bananas and I write 20%, 50%, 80% on the bananas and serve them. And they don't care about the percentage. They just pick a banana. (laughs) This is not ignorance. It's preconceived ideas. And and Gapminder Foundation that I work with now which is a public educator, we ask a number of questions like this. We asked about the percent of people living in extreme poverty, that is not having food enough for the day for the family. Eh? How, how many of them uh, are there, were there, how many percent were there 20 years ago, how many now? Has it doubled, remained the same, or halved? Well, the Swedes answered like this, the Norwegians like this, the British like this, and the Americans like this. And this is the right answer. And I answered this, ask this, what about the number of children in the world? Total number of children. And with children, I mean zero to 15 years old. When I was born, there were less than one billion children, about 800 million children in the world. And this we know quite well. The census, counting of people, we know. It increased like this up to the turn of the century, two billion, more than double during my lifetime. 
And now the best demographers in the world, that is United Nations Population Division. And be careful, those are not any civil servants. They are led by John Wilmoth, who was professor of demography in Berkeley University. And they are the finest, best professionals you can find in the world. They have made an estimate what will happen this, this century. The other two I made up to make it a quiz. They're just fantasy. What do you think? Do they say, well, more or less we have to expect that we will continue the same way and there will be twice as many children by the end of this century? Or do they say, no, no, it will slow down, there will only be three billion. Or do they say, no, the number of children have stopped increasing, there will be no more children in the world. For everyone that turns 15, there will be one born, not more. Well, this is what the Swedes answered. This is the Norwegians. This is Britain, and this is America. And now you know, you just look how the Scandinavian answer. And the lowest proportion of Norwegians and Swedes that answer, that's the right answer. <laughs> the number of children in the world have stopped increasing. It's really one of the biggest events in the history of mankind, and it has passed unnoticed. It's strange to me. Huh? It's strange to me. So what is the big fact? The one fact that happened in the world during my lifetime is this one. Number of babies born per woman on average. And that has been throughout human history, 1800. I could write 1500. I could go back to the birth of Christ. I could go before. I could go into the rainforest. It's more or less six. Five, six, seven children per woman on average. Some get 15. Others get no one. But on average, six births. And <clears throat> through modern time, it only decreased down to five at the time I exited school and went to university. And what has happened since? In my adult time, in my adult lifetime, this happened. It's quite remarkable, isn't it? It's quite remarkable. And we know that this will happen. And we don't want it to go to zero. And we don't want it to one. We want to have it here, more or less. So out of the way from five to two, the world has done five-sixths. It's an enormous transformation. Why do I say it's enormous? Because this is not boring statistics, my friend. This is love, sex, and bedrooms. <laughs> this is what films are about. Even those nasty films which you're not supposed to look at, you know? So what is it that has happened? What is it that has happened? Well, I can show you the result of this. Because this has gone down, we know now when the fast population growth in the world will stop. We know what will happen. Because the number of births have come down, the number of children will not increase. It's only the adults that will increase on average in the world. So <clears throat> if you divide the world like this, I like to simplify. So I decided there are only four regions in the world. And to give Europe a chance, I had to add Turkey here and the whole of Russia. Eh? So that's Europe. This is America, Africa, and Asia. It's fairly straightforward. And we are seven billion people in the world. Each doll here is one billion people. One billion, one thousand millions. Eh? This is what we are. Where do they live? One in America, one in Europe, one in Africa, and four in Asia. That's the world population today. Remember, pin code 1114. Many companies say this is the most important. The biggest number of consumers are in Asia. And, and, and now we know what will happen. Up to the middle of this century, up to, up to about 2050, no more people in Europe. In fact, in spite of the immigration, the number of people in Europe is decreasing. The immigration is not enough to keep the European population stable. It's falling, especially fast in Germany and Russia. They're going down like this. Uh, Scandinavia keep up more or less. Huh? And, and in America, there will be a little more retired people in South America. But in Asia, there will be one billion more. So Asia will grow with 25%, and then fast population growth will be over in Asia. And in Africa, in the next 35 years, the population will double. And then, up to the end of the century, no more in America, Europe, or Asia, but there will be one or probably two billion more in Africa. 
This is where we will end up more or less, give or take one billion. Eh? This is how the world will look like when the big transformation has happened all over. And what is the conclusion? There are two conclusions for European looking south. There will be four Africans to one European, so better start being polite already today. <laughs> My colleagues and friends, I've had the, the privilege to work in Africa in several different functions over the years. I worked in Asia also, partly in Latin America and all over the world. And, and, and in Africa, I have a lot of friends same education as me, and they have kids, and they have that idea that once when the kids become teenagers, they want to make that big trip together with them and show them the world. And they can't get the tourist visa to Europe. Have you thought about that? A well-educated, hard-working African couple who have teenage kids can't get the tourist visa to Europe if they don't have huge amount of money that they deposit in the bank account. This is ugly. They get angry. Of course they like China more. China gives them visa. And, and this, is, this, this, is, this is, yes, there are refugees coming from Africa, but in the future, there will be tourists. Imagine 100 years from now, all the cruisers with Africans coming to watch your beautiful coast here. That's the future for Ole Sund, huh? when the oil and gas is finished. It's the African tourists coming. Yeah, you weren't prepared for that suggestion because it's a little far-reaching. Eh? But already today we see the Asian coming. The Vasa Museum in Stockholm had five years ago 3% from China, 15% now, in just five years. Coming up like this Asian tourism. Eh? And that's what happens first. Now, if I divide this into North and South and East and West, I get what I call the Old West, this concept that there is a Western world, developed countries. Australia I count as, as Asian. They have to get used to it, you know? Uh, they are Asian. And Japan, after all, is just a successful part of it. Yeah, uh, since 2005, most of the Australian trade, import and export, is with Asia. So they will integrate. Huh? And, and uh, the Old West, that was 30% of the world population when I went to school, will be in the future less than 10%. It's a marginal part of mankind. Huh? And 80% of the world population will live in Africa and Asia. Asia, Indian Ocean, will be the main trade in the world. So shipping have to go here. This will be backwaters. And, and, and uh, but you think, yeah, that, that's people, but that's not money. But look, already today, the last few years, two important uh, economical things have happened. First, in the Old West is now only 50% of the GDP in the world half the world economy, and less than half, about 35% of the economic growth. Here, in the rest of the world, we have 50% of GDP and 65% of the growth. That means first the people concentrate here and money is following. Because it's the work of people that generate the money. And it's the need of people that generate the consumption market. So if you would invest in real estate, can you see what you should buy today? It's pretty obvious from this map. You should buy beachfront property in Somalia. <laughs> it's a beautiful beach in Somalia. No, not like Norway I happen to look at, but more beautiful than Florida. Long, long beach. Huh? And you will have four billion plus five billion, you know, nine billion people wanting to go to the beach. Is this fantasy? No, it's not. My closest colleague, who took over my courses at the Karolinska Institute in Global Health, Asli Kolana, associate professor, she had her medical training in Mogadishu. For those obvious violent reasons, she and her family moved to Sweden. Her husband is a surgeon, and, and uh, the son is a commando soldier in the Swedish army, extremely well integrated in Sweden. They, last year, bought beachfront property in Somalia. This is their breakfast table. It was very cheap. Eh? And they got the land title from the shaky government, which exists now, and they got the traditional right from the village where her mother was born and grew up. 
And I've been lecturing at financial institutions in J.P. Morgan as well as in Goldman Sachs after my lecture. Uh, great investors who originated from Somalia came up and said, I did the same, we did the same. You should buy when it's cheap. That's how you make money. You can't buy now in Florida because it's too costly. You should have bought when there were pirates in the Caribbean. <laughs> That's when it was cheap. And we don't have that long-term perspective. And when we look at the film of the Pirate of the Caribbean, it was like nice. Have you noted that they took away all the rapes from that film? They didn't portray it as it was, cruel and vulgar. Huh? And, and, and now, you know, the piratism is going down in Somalia, and in many ways it's going in the right way, but slowly and very, very shaky. Huh? But if I show you now on country level, country by country, I will show you how this big change has happened. And I won't take money in this first round. I will just move on to show my beloved bubble graph here. Here, each bubble is a country. China there and India are the two big bubbles because the size of the bubble is the size of the population. The color is where they are located. Red is Asia. Green, Brazil there, is America. Blue with South Africa there and Egypt there, it's Africa. And these yellow ones are Europe. And down here, we had Latvia here, we had Bulgaria, Czech Republic, and, and many other. Where, where did we have, yeah. All these European countries. This is 1964, it's 50 years ago. Here, number of babies per woman. Small families below, large families above. Here, the length of life. Life expectancy, how long you are expected to live when you are born. 30 years, 50 years, 70 years. And look, up there, the Western world, the developed countries, 50 years ago, they had long lives and small families. And up there, high up there, you had the developing world. They had large families and short lives. How has this changed? And this is not like, this is not like, abstract statistic. This is the bedroom. Whether, whether the young couple, you know, discuss and say, we'll make a baby tonight. We'll have two. They should have shoes. Go to school. We'll buy them a guitar. We'll go to the beach. We'll have a boat to travel with them. We'll be a family. Or whether there was silent patriarchal sex without any talking and you got as many kids as you got. <laughs> eh? And this, this to me is like the bathroom and the kitchen. If you have good sanitation, if you have food on the kitchen table, also some health service, you live longer and kids survive. So this is the nice life which the Western world had acquired already 50 years ago. And now I'll show you what have happened. And this data is amazingly good. It's not perfect. Plus minus 10 to 15 percent is the uncertainty. But the change is so big. So, the, what you will see now correspond to the facts. Here we go. Can you see China? They're moving, a little shaky with Mao Zedong, and then family planning puts in, they go down, Brazil is following, they don't care about the Pope, they put on the condom, and they go down here, Indonesia is following, the Muslim also can put on condom, Bangladesh is overtaking India, and Pakistan is following, African countries is coming, look at Ethiopia, Ethiopia is coming there, it's changing the world. This is the new world. Out of five young couples, four go for two-child families, one have more. And most of them who have more have it for good reason. They need children because they are so poor, so the risk of children dying is high, and if children survive, they need them to go and fetch water and firewood. But in Africa today, half of the women who want to have contraceptives, who want to limit their birth, cannot get contraceptives. It's a shame and it's the worst misinvestment in the world. We don't want this old type of population policy, birth control, telling people what to do in the bedroom. They don't like that. No one wants to have posters in the bedroom. But people make their own choices if they can do that. And if women are free to make their own choices and discuss nicely with their men, they will choose 
on average two. If someone wants to have four or five, that's fine. If someone said, I live without children, if it's their choice, that's fine. I don't think society, culture, or government should enforce anything, but we should enable people to make their choices. We should enable them to do free choices. And the reason why some of the African countries remain up here, you know, is, is, is because they don't have these choices. Here is Congo, there's also war in this country. You know? Tanzania is coming down there, but some, some African countries are more successful, and Ghana is already down there now, and urban Ghana is down in this area. So this is more or less where we can see where, where, um, where the world is going. And you can see very clearly that the average number of babies per woman is 2.5. You see that here? Now, here, Many are below, and you would think, oh, it's because China has a one-child policy. Everyone has heard about that. But it's 1.7. Conclusion, the Communist Party is not so powerful in the bedroom. <laughs> in the square, they decide what people can do, but in the bedroom, they make their own choices. They are influenced. But the interesting thing is Taiwan, which is by many definitions, a part of China, but they definitely don't have a communist party, nor do they have a one-child policy, but they have one child per woman. Huh? And if we go to Hong Kong, the part of mainline China is this, that is Hong Kong. You also have one child per woman, or 1.1. How come? In the Chinese territories where you don't have a one-child policy, you have one child, where you have a one-child policy, you have 1.7. It's nice, it shows the freedom of the bedroom. But it's also something of concern. And when I lectured at a similar conference to this, so it was more of an investment conference in Hong Kong, I ended up in the dinner next to a very successful young banker from Hong Kong. She was only 37 years old. And she really knew about all the changing patterns. She said, very soon, China will export more capital than they will import. And China will outsource uh, manufacturing to Southeast Asia. This is changing. A big new wave is happening. And she explained a lot of things. And when we came to the dessert, you know, I got interested in the person. And I asked her, do you have family? No, I only work, she said. Yeah, I can understand that, but don't you want to have a family? And she looked out of the window, down into the harbor in Hong Kong, and she said, yes, every day I'm thinking about children. It's the idea of a husband I can't stand. We also had, we also had the, the Vice Prime Minister of Singapore, 2013, came with 14 experts in economics, in sociology, in demography to Sweden. They've asked for a one-week study visit. And, and I was given the task to have the first lecture to them in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And, and, and the, the Vice Prime Minister, she said, we just have one question. We want to know how do you make babies? This is called flattering for an old man like me to, <laughs> <laughs> to get that question. And interesting was they said, we picked Sweden because Singapore, we learn from others. We don't have the idea we should find everything out ourselves. When something doesn't work in our country, we go elsewhere and see how they have done it. And we have the same economy as you have. We have the same health service. We have the same child survival. We have the same e educational levels in women. And we have one child per woman and you have two. How do you do it? And after a lot of talking by me and other diplomats, the young desk officer from the Minister of Foreign Affairs, she just summed it all up and said, try gender equity. Hmm? The success in Asia with integration of women in the workforce does not come with that most important part of gender equity, that you share things in life. The young woman, if she marries, is supposed to take care of her parents-in-law and her husband even if they can, by money, buy someone who helps them with the kids. And that's why Japan has 1.4 children per woman. Huh? There, is a, there is complete difference. And, and this, what we have achieved in the Nordic countries, is quite special. It may be a major export product we have in the future. Huh? How do you make babies? And I used, to, I used to tell, being a little private, 
or used to ask another question, why did I, in the fall of 1974, when I was 26 years old and just had graduated in medicine and I had started to work as doctor, but from 1st of October I stayed home for six months and took care of my firstborn child while my wife uh, finished her education. Why did I do that decision? I actually had to quit. This was one year before you had, by law, paid leave. Why would I do that? Anyone here have an idea? A man like me, talking, wanting to show up, staying at home, taking care of children? Come on now. Huh? Yes, love was one component. No, 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 no. Men don't think about that. <laughs> Sorry. Your wife was in investment banking. No, she was finishing midwifery. Huh? And she didn't earn a lot. But it's all about my wife. What did she do that evening when the decision was made? It was, it was 21.30 in the evening. <laughs> she packed a suitcase with my shirts, underwears and sock and put it at the door and said, walk out of my life if you don't do as you have said. <laughs> I don't want any excuse. We had agreed on this. It's called female empowerment and it works. <laughs> and it was love, of course, that made me then realize I have this choice. I have a lovely wife and I have a child or I have nothing. And that means that already then she was in a financial position and she also had friends and some relatives who would support her. Because we had agreed indeed, but when I went to the head of my department and said, I want to stay home with my children, don't even think about it. Then you lose your position and someone else will get it. Huh? It was just awkward male behavior. There was no way 74 you could say that. And she forced me, she bluntly forced me. And she's not the sort of woman that shout to make faces or anything. She just make a packed suitcase and put it there. <laughs> and I'm very happy. I stayed home with all the three kids. And we now have eight grandkids. And the first grandchild, we shared the Thursday so our daughter could continue with her research group. I had the morning. I introduced in the Karolinska Institute the line, Grandpa, leave of absence. <laughs> and it was nice. This integration of men in real life, taking care of kids and family life, has meant more for men than for women. Because women still have double burden of taking responsibility. And men get a nicer piece of it, and they live longer, and they drink less, and they smoke less, and they get less divorced. And I have a complete... This is what it's about. This is really modern. And look at Stockholm, what we can offer today. I always brag about Stockholm. It's difficult when you're in Norway to brag about Sweden. But in Stockholm, the, the bishop of the Church of Sweden, the Lutheran Church, she lives in a lesbian marriage with a biological son. Beat that. <laughs> and I'm, I'm not a member of the church. I'm not promoting the church or anything, but it's sort of, I'm carried away myself on how societies can change, how basic values can change. How we really can change. And this will determine very much about the future of the world, you know, how we will, how we will handle this. So, so uh, uh, if we go back now and look here. Of course, Europe went down first, America then, Asia, oh, many were worried about Asia. They are down at two children per woman, and Africa is on its way down. It will come down here. We don't know really how fast Africa will come down, but you see that Asia came down last. That's why they add one more billion, and Africa will come down slowly. We don't know if it goes down fast, it will be three and a half billion in Africa. If it's slow, it will be four or slightly more. Huh? And... and uh, it's just so difficult to grasp that the world is changing in this way. And uh, it's, it's all because uh, what happens was in the past, father and mother got, on average, six children. 
and the population did not grow before 1800 because tragically one, two, three, four died before growing up to become parents themselves. So on average, two parents left two children in the next generation, then population doesn't grow. This is the reason why there are so few people in the rainforest. They've lived in the rainforest for 10,000 years. The reason there are so few is that they keep dying at a young age. And their life expectancy is about 35 years. So when you hear someone saying, people in the rainforest live in ecological balance with nature, they are lying. It's one word in that sentence which is completely wrong. People don't live in ecological balance, they die in ecological balance. <laughs> it's these tragic deaths, but they indeed know a lot about nature. And that knowledge we should respect. And their human rights should be respected, but we shouldn't be naive and think that it's some sort of a paradise. It's an ugly place. And some feminists should go to the rainforest and ask the 14-year-old girls what they think about those societies. We have almost most child marriages in the world is in the rainforest. And, 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 and what happened then, you know, when, when uh, Norwegians and Swedes filled up North America was not that we got more children. What happened was that more survived. And then, Sweden and Norway filled up Oregon and Washington and Minnesota, and the world population became five billion. That's in short the modern history. And this will not happen. It will not go on like this, because we have almost reached a new balance. In the old balance, death kept control. In the new balance, bedroom keeps control. The young couples disintegrate wonderful sexuality from wonderful reproduction. You can have the children you want and you can have the sex you want. It's one of the most fantastic discoveries we've had in the course of, of mankind, to be able to disentangle the, the, the two. Huh? And we know now that this will more or less happen. But why will we be four billion more if the number of children have stopped increasing? It's strange, isn't it? This is why you think the number of children will start increasing, because the population is growing. I'll show you why. Here, each doll is 100 million. And this is Europe. Uh, Europe below 15 years old, 30, 45, 60. So this is me. I belong to this group. 60 years and older in Europe. Same amount of people in all age groups. This is America. They just lack some old people up there. Africa, very dramatic. Huh? 400 million in Africa below 15 years of age, who's just waiting to grow up and get jobs. And, and they are more than the entire Americas and Europe together. If you start in Argentina, you walk all the way up to Canada. You turn right, go all the way through Europe and Turkey, all the way to Vladivostok. You don't find more below 15 years of age than you find in Africa today. And, and, and uh, Asia, as you saw, the number of children have stopped increasing here. But all these people, they are not missing because they died. They are missing because they were never born. There were not so many born at that time. You saw the number of births increased all the time until now, the last decade. So what will happen is this. Are you aware of what happens to people like me, 60 years and older? Anyone working in health service here? They die. Sooner or later, they die. So they are gone. Have you noticed what happened to the rest of you? You grow older. You grow older, and you have babies. They all die, the rest grow older, and you have babies. They all die, the rest grow older, and you have babies. And then they all die, the rest grow older, and you have babies. Now, the number of children stays the same because they are decreasing in Asia and increasing in Africa. In China today, they are turning primary schools into homes for the elderly. And, and, and it's, it's, really, it's really changed. Here it remains the same. And you can see how marginal Europe and the Americas will be in the world population. It will be all about Africa and Asia in the future. Huh? And, and this is the great fill-up of adults, the inevitable fill-up of adults. Those who are concerned about the environment, and I share their concerns. I share their concerns about the wild animals. I share their concern even more about the climate. But they say many, oh, we have to stop world population at seven billions. 
or at 8 billion. This is impossible if you don't break against the rule and kill people. And you are not allowed to kill people. There's no way we can even up below 10 billion. We are planning for a world with plus minus your 10 to 11 billion plus minus one. That's where we will end up. Eh? And then, of course, there will be some who lives longer. I desperately hope that I will be this person up here. <laughs> because then I can follow statistics for 15 more years, you know, and see what happens. Eh? And see the African tourists coming, you know. Eh? And this is about extreme poverty and gender equity. One of the only factors that could make the world population bigger if, if gender equity comes to Asia. And the modern young Asian women decide that this husband is good, I'll marry him, we'll have two kids. If that happens in Japan, in the whole of China, if it happens now also, the, the most educated in India is now going below two children per woman. So that will be more. So Scandinavia should speak with very small voice about number of children in the world because we constitute one of the only places in the world where number of children per woman is increasing. And the way we consume is a concern. So if you want to solve environmental problem by diminishing population, you should start in Sweden and Norway and take away all the child allowances and the subsidized pre preschool centers and schools. Then the number of kids will drop steeply. And that we don't like, especially difficult to get elected if you do it. Huh? So, so, so we will have to plan for 10 billion. We have to plan for 10 billion. Now, what about money? What about money? I'll show you how the money is distributed in the world. We go directly over there. This is $1 a day. This is $10 a day. This is $100 a day. Huh? And the interesting thing in the world is that the variation in income is 100-fold between sort of normal people in different countries. Hundredfold difference. This was 1975. Here, the developed countries, or the West, this is the rest. This is the poverty line, below which you are hungry. You can't play and work as you should because you just don't have food enough. Eh? And this is what I call the airline. The airline is the line above which you can fly on holiday with your family. Not every year, but sometimes. So most of the world population were living between those, and there were more people below the poverty line than above the airline in 1975. And this is what happened. Now it's an equal, or it's even now more people above the airline than below the poverty line. Shockingly, we still have almost one billion here. Huh? And, but it's a lesser proportion. And look now, 50% of those above the airline are not from West, they are from Asia, they are from Africa, they are from Latin America. The better off in those countries. And this is what will happen in the future. So you can see where you have the customers in the future. Any company, even if you are in the upper income range, you have to move beyond the West. Any country, doesn't matter. You say, oh, I just do high value products so I can stay in Europe and North America. No, 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 no. Then you will be beaten by competitors that can find the consumers on that income segment all over the world. And, and look what happens with what you may call the developing world, that the big hump is coming into the world economy here quite fast. Now, let me show you this. With data, oh, just two photos here. Income data is notoriously uncertain. This is how you get income data from most homes in the world. An often, unfortunately, main interviewer sit with a 25-page questionnaire and ask question to a standing woman, or at the best she can be sitting. And we can't ask for incomes, we have to ask for expenditure. So the income data is wrong by almost plus minus 50%. But the income variation is so big, so we can still use the data. We can still use the data. Eh? And, and it, it looks more or less like this. Eh? I can show you, I think I have that, that prepared here. Uh, yes. This is another way of showing the income distribution from $1 a day, $10 to $100 a day. The red now is Asia, the blue is Africa, green is America, and yellow here is Europe. And this is, yeah, you can see it up there. This is 1977. There were two humps 
as I showed you before, the big hump here, which was Asia and Africa, and then here, Europe and America. On this side, West Europe and North America. On this side, East Europe and South America. And the interesting thing is that the hump, the two humps, will merge. I'll show you this again. I think it's so crucial to see that the humps merge, and we find most of the people somewhere in the middle. Not really $10, but almost $10 away. And, and what does this mean? What does it mean to, to be on these income levels? Well, to show that, let's see how life is. They would cook food over open fire, the one billion in extreme poverty. They use firewood. They don't have tapped water. Many of their children are not in school. They don't get vaccinated. Then you get the light bulb. Then you get a bicycle, then you get a motorbike, then you get a washing machine, then you get a car, and then you fly on holiday. Remember that the world has so many income segments. From here, fire, light bulb, bicycle, motorbike, washing machine, car, and flying. And for everyone doing business, you have to segmentize the world and see where you can go. If you sell menstruation pads, there's a huge market emerging in the world. The number of menstruations in India over the last 30 years increased almost tenfold because the number of children per woman dropped and the breastfeeding period was shortened. And, 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 and one of the main obstacles for young girls in poorer countries who want to continue to secondary school is menstruation. And often there's not a decent toilet where they could change menstruation pads, so they need the menstruation pad that lasts the whole day. It's a huge business opportunity. It's called bottom of the pyramid. It's not the poorest, but just from here on, consumers are piling up. But these consumers are modest. Here is when you really start to feel them in finance that they can start consuming. So it's the two-child families that live Two-child families is more or less from the bicycle. The two-child families here to here. That's most of the world market. Can you see? Most of the world population. They have the light bulb, and they are working hard. They have two children. They have planned their life, and they want to go to the washing machine, to the car, and beyond. That's a very safe market to invest. That's why you have better economic growth there. When people over here, we don't know, they are fed up with flying. What do they want to do? You can't earn much money on me. What am I going to do this summer? I wanted to buy a new boat. I told my wife, we buy a new boat and we can go with the grandkids on the boat. No, she said. She's a child psychiatrist. Huh? Boats are for men. They like to drive around the family you know, and shout to the family. Huh? The others don't like boats. So we took the old boat and we dragged it up and put it in the grass. And the kids like to play in it now. That's much more. They have much more fun playing in the boat. Our grandkids are like by between, between 2, 3 and 10, 11. And then I build tree houses for them. So I've collected wood, secondhand wood now, and I will extend the tree houses this summer. And then we sit in the tree house and play Angry Birds. <laughs> Can you get any economic growth out of me? Yeah, it's when I travel, that's it. Otherwise, I'm quite mod. I don't have so much consumption knee, no, you know. So, but this is quite safe. These people, they want washing machines, they want bathrooms, they want travel, they want a lot of other things. That's where the big economic growth in the world will take place. People want to get out of extreme poverty. They want to don't stay in poverty. They want to get away from poverty. And get me, let me take this a little theoretical. Because what it takes with the world is knowledge and understanding, also compassion. But when we discuss about the world, I think we have too much feelings and too much ideologies. We can, we can look at the world in a very calm way and see these kids. I have taken the photo myself where I worked in northern Mozambique. They live in extreme poverty. They have already halfway through the meal that has been cooked, cooked by the grandma. The parents are in town trying to earn more money, and the four siblings are sitting here. They have already finished the beans and the tomatoes. That was very quick. They still have this porridge, which they will finish while they still are hungry. They are not too thin, these children. This is not a famine situation. Often you think that all these countries have famines. Famines, I mean, bluntly not having food, dying from lack of food, that's rare. 
but living in, 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 in hunger, more or less, more or less hunger, more or less every day, so you don't can use your own resources as a human. You are in a vicious circle of poverty, and it's boring. That's why you don't hear about the 15,000, one 5,000 children that will die unnecessarily today. Today dies more children than the entire earthquake in Nepal. There's a daily earthquake the size of Nepal that kills poor children that is not an emergency. And it's just boring, and it's daily, and it never hits rich, and it never moves out of those areas. But it's dangerous because that's where Boko Haram go and hide, and that's from where Ebola comes. We shouldn't live with it. I went and worked because I had that special knowledge in Liberia three months with the Ebola epidemic, keeping track on the numbers. And why did I go there? Because I had eight grandchildren. I frankly didn't go there because I felt pity for the people who were dying in Ebola. Because I know that in those three countries, small countries in West Africa, Liberia, Sierra Leone, and Guinea, every year there are 70,000 children dying, and Ebola only took out 15,000. Four or five times more die every year of extreme poverty, and I've come to hate extreme poverty. I love money because I know how you can use money wisely. Yeah? And, and, and this is not good for anyone. Of course you also get your heart involved in this, but the problem is you get the heart too much involved so you don't keep your brain cool what to do about it. And that's, you need investments, you need infrastructure, you need ag agricultural input for this one. Look here how you get out of extreme poverty. These two girls had to carry, carry water every day. Huh? And then Mrs. Tapo managed to go to school, so she should count. And by counting, she could then get credits and she bought this wheelbarrow, the fruit of the Industrial Revolution. And she branded it. Can you see how proud she is as an entrepreneur? Mrs. Tapu, it says here. And she can carry home water which takes five people to carry. That's what economic growth is. It's when people get more productive in, in their work. Eh? And she then will carry that home and the girls can go to school. And this is then getting away from poverty. Because it's not getting out of extreme poverty. That's why. Now this woman, she enters into the world market. She's now bringing her agricultural product to the market. And she says she's happy. She's one of the women we have interviewed in my research in, in Malawi, together with Malawian scientists, you know. She says, number one was school. Thank you, government, for training that teacher and paying her salary. And thank you, aid, for paying for that textbook. Uh, and my child is healthy. Thank you, government, for training and paying that nurse. And thank you, aid, for paying that vaccines and, and, and that mosquito net. Now my child is healthy. I can move with my kid. And infrastructure is lovely. Poor people love tarmac. We can move further in one day. And World Bank gave the credit for this. You know? And rights are important. Because my good husband is working in the city to earn money so that we can have a more decent house. And I am alone. And when you are an alone single woman in the, in the village, theft and more terrible thing than that can happen to you. So my human rights are very important, you know. And cell phones are lovely. Because with the technology, I know the prices. I know when to harvest. I know to which market to bring my products so I get the best return. And even better is agri-technology. Would I have had a better planting material? I would have had a better return on all my work. Please help me with breeding. Can I get better, better planting materials? You know? She wasn't bothered so much about genetically modified organisms, you know? because her poverty is much worse than anything that may possibly happen from those organisms. Huh? And, and then she says, credits is wonderful because that enabled me to buy the, the bicycle. And now I can bring the products and I pay back the bicycle in three years. Would I have had to carry this to earn the money to buy the bicycle? Would have taken me 10 years? And when you think about helping people in extreme poverty or making business there, you have one pet idea about this. Either you're a technology nerd and you love cell phones, or you work in the bank business, you, you understand credits, or you are in the left, in the political spectrum, you want health and education, or you are in the right and you want infrastructure and, and technology. She wants everything. She wants the whole thing. 
It's the whole thing that moves her forward, as it did with Norway and Sweden. It was the whole package that moved that out of it. It was not the public sector or the entrepreneurs or the finance. It was the combination of it. Yeah? And she wants a market, but she doesn't want to be a small-scale farmer. Who wants to be a small-scale farmer? If you not have heavy subsidized and a beautiful view in Western Norway, then you can be a small-scale farmer, you know. But otherwise, you don't want it. Huh? She wants to have a paycheck. She wants a job. Come invest in my country. I can make your clothes. I have practiced on my neighbor's uh, sewing machines. I can make nice clothes. Come invest. Huh? And she has the dream, of course. Fertilizer, cement, and electricity. She's very material. She wants the stuff. Huh? And <clears throat> This is more or less how the world looks. If I take the income distribution and make it into 7 billion people, that one earns 500, 1,000, 2,000, 4,000, 8,000, 16,000, 32,000. There are six doublings in the world. Six doublings. We live in a logarithmic world. Uh, and fire and all the way like this, how they live. Now let's end up and look at energy. Let's look at energy. The energy used in the world is oil, coal, and gas, fossil fuel. Then some nuclear, and then bio and hydro, and then the new renewables. Solar and wind. 1.8%. But very promising growth. And very promising drop of cost of solar. Huh? If Europe wouldn't have been as stupid as to put import tariff on Chinese solar panels. Uh, and now perhaps Tesla is also coming with batteries with falling prices. But that's the limiting factor today for renewable, is the, is the price of, of them. So the world run on fossil, as you know here in Norway, not the least in this town. It runs on fossil. 81%. And the richest 1 billion, they use half of it. The second richest use half of what's left, and the third richest use half of what's left. The three billion richest in the world, they use 87% of the world fossil fuel. Don't think about developing countries. It's these billions. This is China, Turkey, Brazil, eh? Russia. These are the successful countries over here, their population. They use the fossil fuel. Over here, it's almost nothing. It's a little kerosene lamp in the village over there. If these people, and there's, there's some opinion in Norway, and also in Sweden, saying we shouldn't have aid for fossil fuel. Tanzania should not use their natural gas resources to produce electricity. It's vulgar, it's arrogant. Of course they have. They have to have a grid on which they can put in the solar. They can't just run the country on solar, because they can't store it. You can't make a cesarean section with solar energy. Because you can't sterilize the scissors and the knife. Because in the autoclave, when you sterilize them, you need lots of energy in 20 minutes. You can't run a mill on solar energy. You can't run a sewing mill on, on solar energy because you can't store it. And, 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 and there's a lot of ideas. The rich over here think that the poor here should sort of solve the climate crisis that these ones are, 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 are in, uh, inducing. These are the ones we have to discuss with. If you live here, you have to discuss with China and Brazil over here. These people, they can triple their carbon dioxide emission. It doesn't matter because it's such a low level. Because this is the children that die in the world. Seven million die in the world and they die there. Burning fossil fuel save the life of children. That's a paradoxical fact. All nice things does not go into the right direction. There are political, very difficult decisions to make. Huh? And, and, and if we can save these children, we can get contraceptives and condoms out to the people over here. That is what helped the population growth to stop and families to invest in their children. And they will come to a nicer future. It's over here that we have to solve this. About 40 years ago, Bangladesh, Bangladesh women were emitting seven children per woman. And Norway was emitting seven tons of carbon dioxide per person. And today Norway is still emitting the same amount of carbon dioxide, but Bangladesh have changed and they only emit two children per woman. Some countries change, some don't. This is a hard fact. And people see that around the world. 
People around the world, when they discuss climate, find us in Europe, and Sweden solved the problem by having nuclear, which ain't nice, but it's also another tough decision we have to make. But people around the world that I meet, scholars, politicians, you know, uh, entrepreneurs, they think that Europe and North America are pretty arrogant because they don't know the realities around the world. They don't know the difference between extreme poverty, poverty, out of poverty, that most have two children per woman. And these people here, they have two children per woman or less. The people here have more children per woman than those two have. So this is not due to having many children. Or as they bluntly say when they've had two beers in Europe, fucking like rabbits. I heard it in America also. I sat in a bar in San Francisco and heard two men who said, well, Muslims, you know, and Africans, they, I mean, they are people who are nice, but they, they fuck like rabbits. And if we let them in, they'll fill our country. And then just 10 minutes later, one man said, he was referring to my grandma, you know, she raised eight children on a small farm in North Dakota. And he didn't say that grandma fucked like a rabbit in North Dakota. <laughs> We have to be very careful with that. We have to be polite to people in the world. We have to have an understanding. You develop beautiful technology. I had the ability to see today what technology has emerged in this city and in this west coast of, 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 of Norway. And I'm sure that that will be used beyond fossil fuel in the future. You will find new ways of using the ocean. You will find new ways of using that fantastic technology and computerized technology which you develop beyond the reason why it started. We, have we are going to change this world quite a lot and we are able to do it. And let's look at this. 2008 in Washington, George Bush was in problem. He was in deep problem. He had no money. He was absolutely broke. Uh, he was in the depth of the crisis. He had to invite, not G7, because they were in the same situation. He had to invite G20 to have someone who could lend him money. Uh, and, and, and then he, he asked them, you know, uh, for money. And this is the final photo. I love this final photo from these international meetings, you know. So I buy them officially. I'm allowed to show them. Because they come with marks. Can you see there's a mark where they should stand? There, and there's Yin Tao's mark, and he has left the mark. Look here, if I do it, here, see? So he left his mark like this, came closer to Bush because he didn't like Ab Abdullah here from Saudi Arabia. And then Bush got sort of nervous and he leans like this <laughs> and rubs shoulder with the socialist from Brazil here. I mean, it's good. And then, then I have the, some contact so I can get hear what they do. This, the one who stands closest to Bush there are the one who lended most money by buying, you know, bonds, American bonds. And who was it who saved the American market economy in the depth of its crisis? It was a socialist, a communist, and two Muslims. <laughs> this is the new world. Eh? Turkey was there, others were there, you know. So Mind the Gap is what we uh, picked to make Gap Mind. Our free website is free, you can get most of this, eh? to upgrade your worldview, you know, and remember, eh? If Bush did it, all can do it. Thank you very much. <laughs>